And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the, the titles of, of, um, of the events at DLD are futile. They change very frequently. The title of our panel session is Celebrate Sleep, which is, of course, a lovely title. But there was another title earlier, which was Are We in the Middle of a Sleep Crisis? Um, I understand turning this more positive, but I think the first title for the first talk after a party at 9 o'clock in the morning is much more appropriate. We are all probably in the middle of a sleep crisis. So thank you very much for uh, coming despite of the sleep crisis. We are going to talk about sleep. You already heard that I have been working on sleep and on circadian rhythms since I was 17, so for quite some time. And I will not introduce these um, well-known people because I will ask them to introduce themselves under the topic, what the hell do you have to do with sleep? Hans, first. <laughs> yeah, first of all, thank you so much uh, uh, for your introduction. Of course, thanks as always to Steffi and, um, and Dominic. Uh, I'm, of course, as opposed to you, not an expert in, in sleep. However, I've always been very interested in, in sleep experiments. And uh, initially, it was actually a crisis because I kind of tried to experiment. First of all, as a teenager, I came across Balzac. Uh, and I was very, very impressed by his productivity of books. So I thought, I should copy that, and he drank 50 coffees every day. So that didn't really work out. I then came across, uh, a few months later, after abandoning that, the Leonardo da Vinci rhythm, and that was kind of more promising, and uh, uh, that means like every three hours you sleep 50 minutes, uh, but it created all kinds of other problems, because these 50 minutes sometimes were at the wrong moment, and so on, and particularly one needed this big alarm clock for dormitories, you know, to then wake up after the 50 minutes. So once I went on a vacation, from the Da Vinci Rhythm and forgot the alarm clock and my entire building lift for a week uh, on the Da Vinci Rhythm. I was evicted from the apartment. So all kinds of misadventures happened. I then came up with the marathon where we had this idea in 2006, still ongoing, the Serpentine, in London to do these non-stop 24 hours events, which are very exciting for us because they bring all the disciplines together. But I had understood always that one would actually be uh, awake for 24 hours. But it all changed when in 2006, 7, I don't exactly know when it was, Steffi, as she does it so wonderfully, because Steffi, and we should all give a very big applause for Steffi, the great junction maker. <laughs> Steffi said, you have to meet my sleep guru, Till. And so she took me over at the DLD dinner, uh, and it was fascinating because a kind of an argument broke loose because I had all kinds of opinions on sleep and Till said it's all wrong. It's all wrong because there is something like an internal clock and you, you, you cannot just impose all kinds of ideas to this internal clock. You need to find your internal clock. So I kind of went back to London uh, and I started to kind of think what is my internal clock and I little by little then found out that I function best when I go to bed at midnight and sort of wake up at six, seven o'clock. And uh, then I thought, wow, I just need to adapt everything to this um, internal clock. And in a way, obviously I was kind of devastated because for quite some time I didn't reach the productivity from before. And then I thought, what could one do? And then a couple of uh, ideas came up. We continued the Serpentine Marathon, but we actually realized that we can sleep at night because we do them live during the day and then it goes on radio. It's an online radio and you know people can still listen in. Uh, so there is something for every rhythm, because I think it's kind of important, uh, as there are all these, as Till shows us, genetically different sleeping rhythms, that when we you know, run an art institution, that we give something to everyone. Because if we have opening hours from 10 to 6, we exclude a big part of people you know, whose rhythm this is not. Hence, you know, this idea of actually uh, doing it uh, for 24 hours. I then started to invent clubs. Um, because I felt in, in cities today, it's really problematic that we can no longer improvise because of schedule. One has to, it's really a nightmare to get 20 friends together. You've got to plan it weeks ahead, and I believe in improvisation. So I thought we could do the Brutally Early Club. So together with the urbanist Markus Miesen, we did the Brutally Early Club, and we have now two clubs. One is at 3 a.m., uh, <laughs> and that's basically for people, you know, who either get up super early or who want to go to bed you know, very late. And then we have another club called 
the Brutally Early Club at 6 a.m. Uh, and that, in a way, serves people with all kinds of sleeping reasons. The great thing is, you've got no traffic jam. You cross London in 10 minutes, uh, and also no one, none of your friends can say that they have prior schedule, because no <laughs> one has prior schedule at 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. But I am very deeply indebted to Till. Um, but I heard from other people that since you've changed your sleeping habits, that you are, first of all, in time with when you speak, and secondly, you are more understandable. So there are huge advantages of sleeping properly. Ariana, why, so, what do you have to do with sleep? So um, I had my own uh, wake-up moment uh, in 2007 when I collapsed from sleep deprivation, broke my cheekbone on the way down. And that was the moment when I began to study the importance of sleep in our lives and the dangers of not sleeping. And um, that led to a book called Thrive that I published two years ago, and a new book that's coming out. We have copies for you, The Sleep Revolution, which really documents, as you know very well, Dil, the incredible sleep science renaissance that's happening right now, which is unprecedented and which demonstrates unequivocally that we have been living under the collective delusion that sleep is a time of inactivity, that sleep is a waste, and that, in fact, the less we sleep, the more productive we are. And as you show brilliantly in your research, in fact, when we are sleep-deprived, we are cognitively impaired. Uh, in fact, uh, being awake for continuous uh, um, hours on end is the cognitive equivalent of being drunk. And we are living in that world right now, just as we are entering the fourth industrial revolution, where the world is um, accelerating in terms of change, in terms of the need to adapt to the change and to be wise about our decisions. This is the time when we are actually still living and working according to the first industrial revolution, when that was exactly the moment when sleep began to be dismissed. Up until then, um, I have this whole section on the history of sleep. Sleep was seen as a gateway to the mystery of what it is to be human, to a deeper part of ourselves. You know, in, in ancient Rome and in ancient Greece, people would go to temples and incubate dreams about healing, about wise decisions. And we abandoned all that in the first Industrial Revolution when everything was mechanized and sleep became another resource to be exploited. And it was believed, including by Thomas Edison, who famously said in 1914 that sleep is an absurdity and that human beings are going to basically uh, abolish it as they progressed. So it was seen almost as pre-modern. And so anybody who wanted to be a winner, especially the men, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm excluding the men in the room, who I'm sure are all very enlightened, but other men, you know, um, not sleeping became a size of uh, braggadocio, kind of a macho man. You know, I had dinner with a guy recently who's, who claimed that he had only slept four hours the night before, and I thought to myself, but I didn't say it, you know what, if you had left, slept five, this dinner would have been a lot more interesting. <laughs> but, but you know that this, this is a, there is a transition from an old macho saying to a completely different macho saying, but they sort of mean the same. And the old saying was, mine is longer than yours. Yeah. And the new saying is, mine is shorter than yours, referring to sleep. <laughs> um, the, the good thing about that is that even women can do it now, because they can also say, mine is shorter than yours. Absolutely, but now we are changing that. And so I'm identifying a lot of new role models, like you, like Hans Ulrich, like Miriam, like the um, CEO of um, Microsoft, Satya Nadella, who says, I sleep for eight hours, and if I don't, I'm not as good a CEO. Now, a CEO would not have admitted that. Even two years ago, even if they slept eight hours, they would never admit it. But now it's all changing, and people are beginning to see sleep as a performance enhancement tool, and athletes are ahead of the game because they've recognized 
that sleep actually makes them better on the court and in the field, and they are integrating it in their practice. So we're going through this amazing transition period, and uh, we're doing a whole college outreach to educate young people who think in colleges that if you pull an all-nighter, you're going to do better at your exams, when in fact the truth is that you're entering the exam room already cognitively impaired. Ayana, I think it's very important to point out the enhancement aspect of sleep, but I have difficulties that we are, and again, you do that, um, get stuck in cognitive performance, um, athletic performance, um, performance per se. But we should not forget that one of the first things that goes with sleep deprivation is social competence. And that has nothing to do with performing in a race or, or in an exam, it has something to do with what our species is built upon, and that's mm -hmm. communication between people. You can show that with sleep deprivation, people don't even are, aren't even able to recognize what faces tell them anymore. And if we start going into, um, as leaders, into a group of people, and if we can't read their faces, we can't be leaders. That brings us to leaders in industry and sleep in economy. Mirjam Meckel, what do you have to do with sleep? Well, actually, um, first of all, I hope I, I do sleep once in a while at night. A good night's eight hours sleep because it's exactly like you just said, that uh, you feel better, you're more productive, you're uh, socially um, better connected to other people. And I started to, to get interested in the field around uh, almost 10 years ago when, due to a similar um, um, encounter with my uh, restrictions, like Ariana told about hers, I um, went into medical sleep deprivation. And I found it really amazing what, what happens in, in that situation. After like a 24-hour sleep deprivation, you, you realize that you're a totally different person and the other people doing it with you um, are uh, in the same way changed. So they uh, develop uh, an interesting kind of humor. They it, are totally... It's called being silly. Being silly, which is a nice uh, part of, the, of humankind, uh, being able to be silly. Um, to be very communicative, to be totally free of uh, self-inflicted restrictions and all kinds of other experiences. And the most important thing is after that, a lot of people really can go back to a regular uh, night's sleep uh, of eight hours without being disrupted. So that was my, my uh, trigger uh, experience uh, to, to dive deeper into uh, sleep. And now I'm working um, on, a, on a bigger thing, maybe a book or a series of articles for our business magazine uh, to, to an analyze why sleep has in a way, or is turning into a business model. Um, and that's something that we really need to closely, lo closely look at, because um, it's one of the, the parts of developing our society into something that you could call like neurocapitalism, where the brain and, and the human being is more or less a resource that can be exhausted and, and used up to levels of productivity that need to be enhanced and enhanced and enhanced. And as we heard, we are in the, the age of self-enhancement, so um, making sleep more productive is also up to us. Uh, we need to wear uh, the, the Jubone um, UP24, for example, to track our sleep, to know how we sleep, uh, whether we sleep the right way, whatever that might be. And the funny thing, or not so funny thing, is that one of the ideas is to really compress the hours of sleep, because not only managers say, I'm great, I only need four hours of sleep, but uh, that um, like, uh, has something like a spillover effect into society, and a lot of people think they need to sleep shorter to be productive. And whatever we know from, from sleep research tells us uh, the other way around. So I think we need to look closely into that, and I, I, I keep up a quote of, of Arthur uh, Schopenhauer, the, the um, ancient German philosopher, who said, Sleep is the real core of life, so we're not just resting a little bit, but we are going back to something which is basically human, um, and we need it to be um, the, the human kind we need to be during the day. And that is a very interesting development I'm, I'm researching right now. We I think that is such a key point that Miriam made, that 
Um, it's really um, a bridge to reconnecting with ourselves. And especially as we've become so hyper-connected with technology, it is even more important to have a way to reconnect with our own wisdom, because we are swimming in data and drowning for wisdom. And if we are not able to get the insights from the data, all the data is not going to be very useful. So this particular moment, it's, it's all the more important to tap into our own wisdom and understanding. Um, sleeping the, a certain amount of hours is very individual. Some people do need very little sleep, um, and others need more. But there's another aspect which, as, as a circadian biologist, has to be mentioned, and that is when we sleep, is also very important because when we sleep at the right time, opened up by our internal body clock, then we can sleep much more efficiently. And you just said people are shortening their, their sleep to have more activity time. What you then very often get into is a vicious cycle because you're getting so ineffective that you don't get your work done. And then you have to sleep even less. And that is what I'm what I have been observing in many, many cultures, where people are not realizing that they, are, they increase their wake time by, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4%, 10%, but they're decreasing their efficiency by 30%. And the, the net mm -hmm. effect is, is just a very uneconomical way to deal with your lives. But the, the interesting thing is that um, the, the logic in, in other parts of research just goes the other way around. If you look at, for example, what the military research institution of the US, um, the DARPA, uh, does uh, or has done for years, um, that's very interesting. They, they started with a little bird, uh, which is, I think it's the white crowned sparrow. That's a bird that can fly for a week without sleeping which is probably a basic mechanism of nature so that the bird can, can uh, like use uh, the time to, to, get, um, to, to, to move uh, onward and nevertheless get food and, and uh, be safe. So that's a natural uh, reason for that. But what uh, the research um, fi um, um, financed by DARPA does is to try to, um, uh, to make possible the spillover to, to the human being to really create um, the, the never tired fighter. So that's another reason, a functionality reason, why research tries to, to shorten sleep periods or even erase sleep periods to, be, to, to, to turn the human being into a, a productivity uh, robot in a way. And I think that is something that really uh, is totally different from, from what you're talking about. Um. Two things, migrating bird don't need a lot of social competence, and um, they just have to <laughs> totally stay in true. the air. <laughs> and uh, secondly, of course, the most ridiculous thing in modern science is that we decide to um, economize time-wise on something we don't even understand. Yeah. We sleep researchers still can't ask the most basic questions, like um, what is sleep really for? What does sleep really do? We know a lot, but we still don't know it holistically, totally, and um, therefore, how can we shorten something of which we don't even know what it is for? We have no objective measure for what a good night's sleep is. Most sleep research still relies on asking people, how did you sleep? Now, I don't think evolution has pulled the tri trigger of consciousness, makes us unconscious for something like six to eight hours, in order to be able to wake up and report what we have just experienced, namely, my sleep was good. If I was sleep deprived, like you just ex explained, and then I sleep, I very often wake up and I feel not very refreshed, although that sleep was extremely useful. So we, we sleep researchers have to go down and make our really basic homework and answer the basic questions, and then we couldn't decide whether we can shorten this feature, this very important feature in our lives or not. I have the suspicion that once we really know what sleep does, we will not vote to shorten it. But it's Hans fascinating also because actually <clears throat> I read the other day this quote from John Steinbeck who said it's a common experience that a problem difficult at night is resolved in the morning after the committee of sleep has worked on it. This kind of magical thing that all of a sudden 
after sleep. That seems to be um, a, a solution. Like Ariana, I kind of had in a very similar way around 2006 a breakdown and then came you know, to this idea of actually sleeping. And one thing which is kind of interesting is that what I found difficult is actually not you know, the conclusion that I had to sleep, but particularly after our conversation, um, it became crystal clear that one had to sleep, however, how one could actually quietly sleep without having FOMO, without being worried, etc. And then this amazing thing happened. Um, at this uh, assistant in the office who would always come six, seven hours late to work. I mean, we start at nine in the morning, so we, he would arrive maybe at 4 p.m. Um, and <laughs> obviously it caused a problem, and you know, in my office this is a real problem, what are we gonna do? However, you know, he did extraordinary work, so I thought we need to kind of find a solution. So he explained to me that his inner rhythm, or his inner time, you know, quote your book, is really that he has to sleep during the day and he can only work at night. So all of a sudden I walked in London and I thought, wow, this is the solution, because basically he could be my personal night assistant. So then <laughs> all the FOMO was gone, because basically I would always, you know, he would start working at, seven, uh, at 11 p.m. and then, you know, we would have an hour before I go to sleep at midnight, and then he would continue to research and do all kinds of things, and then I would wake up at 7 a.m. and sleeping without any FOMO, and then we would have another hour. So in a way, the night assistant was a great solution. But obviously there are lots of other you know, solutions and also researches. And I was particularly curious because till uh, you told me once about this questionnaire, the Munich chronotype questionnaire you're working on with Martha Merrow, and I was kind of wondering where that stands now and what are the kind of most recent findings of that research, because I thought it would be exciting. Um, hear that here in Munich. I, I think that would be almost too long to go into because we, we, we want to know a lot about what you think about sleep. But the Munich Chronotype Questionnaire is now going into... It's a questionnaire where you can go and find out what, what your chronotype is, meaning where is the sleep window where you should try and put your sleep. It's a very simple questionnaire, but it's a subjective questionnaire. What we are developing now, and I hope it's going to be ready this year, is two things. First of all, I always find that p if people can really, on a day-to-day -day basis, look at their sleep, um, they, they learn a lot, they have feedback, because only if we have a record of what we do, um, we actually have an insight in what we're doing. And what we're providing is a very simple way which, uh, where you can use Twitter um, and just every morning say, I, I fell asleep then and I woke up then, and then you can go to your personalized web page and you can look at your sleep record um, over as long as you want. Uh, it's a trade-off because we will use your data anonymously to do research and you will get um, something back from your research. Another thing that we're developing, and I'm still looking money for it, is a platform where people, and I think there are lots of crazy people in the world who wear these things that uh, record your activity, and we want, to use, we want to provide a platform where you can upload your activity recordings and we, with academic and not just commercial uh, um, analysis software, can tell you um, how your sleep was and when you slept. And again, we can give you feedback over, uh, and this is not subjective, it is objective because you wore something. Now, it is, for this, it is extremely important that you, who are always running around with these things and are these people who are yelling suddenly in the middle of the road and saying, I've reached my death! Um, that these people <laughs> demand to get their real data, because you, most of you don't. And only if demand, you demand that you get your raw data, you can actually upload it to the web page that we will provide this year, I hope. Um, and you are, not, you are not relying on unpublished software um, by the providers of these gadgets, who actually do without asking you, unlike us, they don't have ethical approval, who do a lot of research with your data, with your raw data. So you should be more on top of your own life and ask for your raw data. I think that's a great idea. And um, in fact, we've actually partnered at the Huffington Post with Jawbone, which is what I'm wearing here. And every morning on our morning show, Half Post Rise, Instead of having a weather girl to tell you how the weather is, which you can just step outside and see how the weather is, we have a sleep girl or a sleep guy who tells you how the world slept the night before. 
And uh, people, again, are becoming more and more aware that the same way we need to charge our phones. Have you noticed how Eva, everybody here knows approximately right now how much battery remains on your smartphone? And if it gets like below 13%, you begin to get anxious and you look around for a recharging shrine, lest anything would happen to your precious smartphone. But when, if you had asked me the morning I collapsed, how are you, Ariane? I would have said fine. And I don't know about Miriam or Hans Ulrich, but we've all gotten so used to being perpetually exhausted that we don't even remember what it's like to be fully recharged. And the feeling of fully recharged is extraordinary for me, not just because, as Till said, we are more productive and we are more socially competent, but I, in my case, I feel I really love and enjoy my life. And when I'm sleep deprived, I don't really like myself. I become more reactive. I uh, don't enjoy what I'm doing. And it's not worth it. So it's almost like monitoring ourselves and seeing the difference in the way we approach life, in the way we deal with challenges, in the way we solve problems after the Committee of Sleep has gathered and found solutions. But I'm also kind of fascinated that, that three of the four people on this stage, and the fourth is rather extraordinary because he's been working on sleep all his life, but the, the rest of us have all collapsed from sleep deprivation. Are we, like, very unusual? Is there anybody in the audience who had a problem because of sleep deprivation, or is it just the three of us? <laughs> oh, good. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. I would love you to write about it for the Huffington Post. And we have our editor-in-chief, Sebastian Mathis, and our editorial director, Chernod. Would you please stand so that they can see you and they can <laughs> come to you? And somewhere here we have our blog editor. But we, in the way, same way that... Professor Ronenberg is collecting data. We want to collect stories. Because I feel when we hear from each other, we learn that it's, this is not something to hide. This is something to talk about. And these are ways we can support each other and change to be infinitely more productive and happier. Miriam, you seem to relate to this storytelling. I do what? You seem to relate to this idea story. of storytelling. Yes. I mean, you're yes. writing. Yes, I do, because You're telling stories. it's really, uh, it's, it's uh, in a, in a uh, well, positive and negative way amazing how many people uh, can tell stories about uh, sleep uh, deprivation, um, unintentional sleep deprivation, and uh, what it does uh, to them. And nevertheless, um, I would say, like, at least a third, maybe half of the people, you, uh, if you talk to them, um, from my uh, research perspective, it was like they are really um, uh, meandering between, I know I need to sleep more and I need to sleep better, and on the other hand, I would like to have more time to get my work done um, for family, friends, and all uh, these things we would like to do in life every day. So uh, one of the stories I would like to tell, and I, I experienced uh, it for myself, I tried it out. I went to Boston f um, to visit one of the new startups in, in sleep research. The name is Think. And they're providing a little um, uh, uh, mechanism where you have electrodes um, on, your, on your skin, in, in, on your um, uh, um, brain uh, part here in the front part of your head, and one after, um, behind the ear and one behind the neck. And then you can use an app to, to regulate, to steer um, uh, transcranial uh, current stimulation. And the funny thing is you, you can buy that for 300 bucks um, without any restriction. And then you can put it on and like, have your brain grilled in a way uh, with uh, electric current with different programs, be it activity, be it um, calming down program. And I tried out uh, the activity program and it was really amazing because um, afterwards, you feel uh, refreshed, you feel, in a way, enlightened, let's put it like that. And it worked out very well um, not to be sleepy, because I couldn't get uh, a good night's sleep at all afterwards. So if you think of this, um, and this is just the beginning of, of using neuroscience um, to, to improve our uh, capacity of the brain and to, to get rid of the restrictions, that's my story where I would say, I really think um, we need to be careful about that. 
I, I understand that research wants to do a lot of things, and I myself have to admit that sometimes I would like to, to be able to steer my, my mindset via app, because, of course, it's, it's easy to do in, in an uh, environment where productivity is something that always uh, is reflected as necessary uh, to every, every person. But um, I really think we should be careful about that. I think you should be very careful about that. Um, Hans Ulrich, you remember that when we first talked about sleep, I told you a story about a washing machine. And the last time I spoke about sleep in the washing machine was at the DLD Women, and I got very bad reports because um, they said I was descending on the women um, by explaining them what sleep was by using the washing machine, um, which I don't do. I tell it to everybody. <laughs> And I would like you to raise your hands. Who is using an alarm clock uh, during the week? Interesting. So have you ever thought about what that means? Yes? It simply means you haven't slept enough. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't need an alarm clock. Um, sleep is the, is the end product of a long evolution. Um, and I don't like the word, our brain is not working at full capacity, because that is also not true. We're always working at 100% capacity. We can shift things into different compartments, but um, it's, we're never working with an empty brain um, um, uh, at any time of our life. But sleep is a product of evolution, and so is a washing machine. Now, modern washing machines are under selection pressure. They have to... Um, um, be better than the other company's washing machine, they have to satisfy customers, they have to comply to water rules and electricity rules and so forth. And um, mod modern washing machines have little, if you put on the program, they tell you, I will, it, this will use, this will take two hours and 45 minutes. Now, who of you would go to such a washing machine after two, mi two hours press the button and say, this must be enough. <laughs> what you get is dirty and wet laundry. What I can't understand is that practically the entire room does that every morning by using the button and say, oh, this must be enough of a program that has evolved over millions of years and you are now all getting up with dirty and wet laundry. You have to be aware of that. And once you become aware of that, your appreciation for a good washing cycle in the machine and for a good sleep would be much greater because it's exactly the same thing. We have one and a half minutes left. Short statements. Well, I cannot improve on the washing machine metaphor. And, I, and, and as you know, Till, it's borne out by the latest research at the University of Rochester, which actually says that what's happening during sleep is actually clearing out the toxins that accumulate in the brain in the course of the day. And if we don't do that, there are now associations with Alzheimer's and a multiple of other diseases. So this is really, for me, an amazing time to be having this panel at DLD because it truly is a golden um, moment for scientific discoveries. In the United States, you know, the first scientific sleep center was launched at Stanford University in 1970. And now there are over 2,500 scientific sleep centers. There is no university, no medical school that does not have a sleep center. So um, we are discovering amazing things about how critical that time is, that it's not unproductive, that it's incredibly productive, and that, in fact, human beings, around, unlike machines, need downtime. Yes. I just yeah, say, yeah. sleep is the new black. Sleep is? Sleep is the, the new, new black. black. That's very nice. Yeah. Period. <laughs> I was actually reading this morning Ariana's wonderful book, and, and uh, which is urgent, you, you all read. And, and what was amazing is that actually, the more I read, the more images popped up. And I was actually kind of all of a sudden becoming aware, and it brought it back to my field, you know, which is the field of art, that there is such a thing as a kind of an art history of sleep. There are so many extraordinary masterpieces in painting, you know, in art, which actually show sleep. And just a few examples, of course, Goya's Sleep of Reason, if you think about Rousseau's masterpiece, no? The Sleeping Gypsy, if you think about Fusli's the, the Nightmare. And then, to just give another example, uh, actually Salvador Dali, the piece from 
1937, uh, called Sleep, which is Dali's kind of portrait of sleep. And that obviously, Dali brings us to the surrealist interest in sleep. Um, and we were chatting before, um, over coffee, before we started the panel, that obviously a very interesting thing would be to discuss the connection to dream, which is a chapter also in Ariana's book. But Thiel then recommended that maybe that should be a panel on itself, and uh, <laughs> Steffi immediately said it's a great idea for 2017. So this is then end of part one, and then we're going to have part <laughs> two. And I wanted to pick up on your Schopenhauer quote, because there is another Schopenhauer Hans quote. Yeah. Pick up shortly. It's very short. He said, each day is a little life, every waking and rising a little birth, every fresh morning a little use, every going to rest and sleep a little death. There would, be, um, there would never be these multiple lives if we did not have sleep. Sleep is urgent. Thank you very much. Thank you.